Got a new one out, let me in on uh, Point Blank, a new company for you as well, right? Yeah, it sure is. Yeah, and uh, is there something special, something new about the album for you? Yeah, I was just real glad to be able to uh, to make a record the way that I wanted to make one. Uh, it's, it's really been a while since I've uh, made a record that way and had the record company completely behind it. I mean, they, they uh, didn't have any... any uh, anybody in particular they they just said do do it the way you'd be the most comfortable doing it and uh i worked with uh, the same band that i've been touring with for years and and uh the um, producer i had worked with on all the alligator records all three records i've made for them and it was just a real a real comfortable fun record you know the kind that i i knew i could make and uh i just, just felt like that, that, that you know, for a while, that every every record there was something that I felt like I could have done a little bit better. Just if, yes, you know, and this one, I don't feel that way about it. I feel like it, it's the best one I could do. So it satisfies you then, eh? Yeah, I'm really happy with it. And you had total control over what what went on the album, that kind of thing? They didn't have, they didn't say anything about any anything. They just said, you make the music and, and we'll uh, do the, uh, the rest of it. Uh, that was just, it's real nice. I mean, they, they didn't, there wasn't one thing that, that they weren't happy with the way that I wanted it. They didn't say, well, you can do it your way, except would you just do this for us? I mean, everything was straight ahead, just a lot of fun. And they were happy with the record, too. Well, that's real freedom right there. Yeah, no kidding. My favorite song off the whole thing is the Medicine Man song. You know, I've been trying to convince them that, that, that they should put that out as a single. That was the one that I thought was the most uh, accessible to radio. <laughs> and they've put out two two songs before it and they keep telling me that, that, uh, that they're that they're going to release it as a single uh, for the next one but uh, yeah, that I hope they do that, I figured that, that was their business so I wouldn't bitch too much about it but I've definitely been letting them know that I thought that that was uh, the one that should be getting the airplay it seems to have this real nice deep groove to it uh, is there anything special about where that song came from the uh, English guy wrote that song it's real strange uh that was one of the tunes that uh, had just gotten sent to my office, and this guy had written two songs, and both of them were real good. I didn't, I didn't have time to do the, the other one he'd written, but uh, uh, I'm hoping that, that this guy will, will send some more tunes. We just did a tour of Europe, and I was hoping to, to meet the guy while we were there, but I, I didn't. He didn't even have a telephone, supposedly. <laughs> and, uh, we, he, he's got a. a or a, a manager someplace that you can get in touch with, but the guy himself doesn't even have the, his, doesn't have the phone. So I don't know. It was a real strange, strange uh, song to be getting from an English guy. But uh, he uh, he has a real low, strange voice on his own. Uh, and this other song he he wrote is kind of a hound book sound and tune. It's, it's a real nice song too. But I've never heard of this guy before. Well, that's a hot tune. Yeah, I thought so too. Yeah, what else did they release as singles? Um, uh, Illustrated Man, and now I think they're they're gonna release uh, Life Is Hard, or maybe already have. I believe they already have released that as a CD single. Let's talk about Illustrated Man, though. Uh, from the buzz in the bio, of course, it it says that's about your own tattoos. Is that true? Well, it, actually, I didn't like the song. Uh, the guy that did write it had written a, a song off, off the last record, Winter of 88, and I met him when we were doing a show in Nashville, where he's living now, and just in the well, half an hour or an hour after the show that I had talked with him and showed him some of my tattoos, I guess he got the idea for the song and uh, came up with it. It really surprised me that, uh, that he remembered uh, as many of the tattoos as he did and uh, <laughs> came up with that, with that idea. He's a real good writer, though. He, he comes up with, he submitted about 30, 30 or 40 songs. So, how did you get into tattoos, anyhow? Uh, I was gonna be 40, and I was kind of, kind of bored, and I wanted to do something I hadn't, I had never done before. Uh, I was actually watching a friend of mine uh, get tattooed here in New York, and uh, after, after watching for a while, I decided, well, yeah, I'll give that a try. And, uh, I, that's something I had thought about for a long time, and I just didn't know. Uh, I wanted to go through the pain or not, uh, but actually it, 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 it was just a lot of fun. Uh, you know, I, I kind of slacked off. I haven't gotten too many. In fact, I haven't gotten any in the last couple last couple of years. But uh, 
it, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still enjoy them, and, and uh, there's, there's several people left out there that I, I would uh, really like to have a tattoo by. I mean, <laughs> they put out their own magazines, and they're like, they're, they're uh, star tattoo people, too. Sure. You know, it's just a whole uh, subculture. Oh, there's some real interesting people I uh, really enjoy getting my tattoos, but I'm running out of space, and uh, running out of spaces that don't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really like that look, the completely full, you know, the bodysuit. I don't, I never did really want to go that far. Um, I got a few, a few places left, though. <laughs> I haven't completely stopped yet. But room for more still, huh? Yeah, I kind of got a little room left. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's talk about the blues. Now, I, I just want to bring up something that I uh, read in the Eric Clapton interview in the recent Rolling Stone. And basically, he was saying blues is dying a graceful death. And he says that Robert Cray is the only guy doing the blues. Now, after talking with Robert Cray and, you know, like a dozen other, other blues players, every one of those guys says that blues is in one of the best shape it, it, it's ever been. Yeah, I don't see it dying at all. Yeah, I so. I don't see it dying. Uh, it's not the same as it was uh, 30 or 40 years ago. Um, I mean, really, it was, it was, then it was completely uh, uh, people played by black people for black people. And, and usually it was, uh, a, lot of, a lot of people came, became blues players rather than, than uh, pick cotton or do manual labor. And it really, uh, you know, it was a complete different thing, but uh, the music, I don't think has has changed quite that that much. Uh, it's probably not quite as as raw as it was. But the people doing it definitely are are different. Uh, I imagine most people who come to see blues now are, are probably white, uh, and of course there's black and white people playing it. But it, it's changed. But I don't see it dying at all. It's, I mean, there's a little different thing. Changing is totally different from from uh, from dying. But I don't think Eric ever saw what blues was like uh, in in the South, you know, 30 years ago. Anyway, he got most of his stuff from, from listening to records. Uh, so I don't know where he came up with that. <laughs> from there, it's, it's his, his opinion. Everybody I talk to says the blues is having a great time right now. Yeah, I think it is too. Yeah, especially in, like, Europe, I understand. That's a hotbed over there. Well, we just got back from Europe, and it was, it was excellent. Well, let me ask you about, uh, like, this the early 60s, that kind of time, uh, you, you were doing the blues, and it seems to me it, it would be coming natural to you, coming from, you know, the area country you, you were from and everything. At this time, like you were saying, like guys like Eric Clapton are over there learning it from records, and it becomes a, a real big deal, you know, once they started spitting it, like, back. Hell yeah. So, w what was it like uh, learning the blues in the States? Well, actually, really, uh, at first, I learned it from records before I was old enough to, to go to clubs. When I, was, <laughs> I guess I heard my first blues records when I was 11 or 12, and uh, about the same time I started playing guitar, and and I was I was buying the records uh, for well, three years or so. It's about the time I got to be 15, I started playing clubs and uh, uh, going to clubs. I had a fake ID and all that, so... Uh, it wasn't, wasn't long before I got to actually go out and, and, and see acts too, and they, they were they were really a lot of great people coming through uh, coming through part of Texas that I lived in, Texas and Louisiana. Uh, most of them came to, to black clubs, but there was a club called the Raven that everybody played at. BB could come through there, and Bobby Bland, Clifton Chenier, and, uh, I don't know, and they were great local people that you could go hear. Uh, any night of the week, too, around Houston, you know, Lightning Hopkins was, was down there, and Albert Collins, I sure. had seen Albert, uh, he recorded one of the same studios I recorded at in Beaumont, and really, uh, it was a, a great area for music. I, I didn't realize how good it was until I until I left and, and went a few more places, you know, I figured it, that everywhere was like that, it definitely wasn't, I mean, there, there, was, there was really great music in that area, you could hear the, uh, uh, you know, the country stuff and the, the Cajun stuff from Louisiana and the, the Mexican stuff from you know, from the Mexican border. Sure. So there was all kinds of different music down there. Uh, Western swing and regular country you heard on the radio all the time. Uh, but the Mexican and the Cajun stuff, you, you really didn't hear.
pretty much dead if you weren't in that area. So it turns out it's kind of like a Texas melting pot down over there. Oh, it was, it was excellent looking back on it. Uh, I didn't realize how good that we had it down there until I went a few other places. I was, it was really lucky that I got to grow up someplace like that because that's about all there was was, was music. But there was plenty of that. Like, like the Muddy Waters song, the blues had a baby and they named rock and roll. <laughs> Now all the stuff on uh, this latest album, Let Me In, you know, it's it sounds like blues definitely, but it sure sounds like primal rock and roll at the same time. And that's yeah, but I, I don't know where to draw the lines really. Uh, I grew up listening to both and, and liking both, and it's real hard to tell sometimes. Like Sugar Reed, you know, what is it? Uh, I don't know if, it's a, if you'd call it a, a, a blues song or an R&B song or a rock and roll song. It's just, it's just a, a real a nice, fun song. In some cases, it's real hard to I've only seen you perform one time, and that was uh, back in 1973. Wow, it has been a while. And at that time, I thought of you as a rock star, if you know what I mean, as, yeah. as opposed to a blues man. You know, you were like a rock star to me at the time. Well, that's pretty much what we were trying to do with Johnny Winter Inn, was to, was to uh, reach over that line. And now, uh, basically, I, I would call you a blues man again. Now, I guess what I'm asking here is, you know, there seems to be stages in different people's career. Do you do you find the blues is a, a a better place to be as a musician as your career continues to unfold? That kind I, of thing. I feel more more comfortable being uh, being there. Uh, I enjoyed the the Johnny Moran period, but uh, uh, I didn't want to do it for for that long. Uh, I did it for about as long as I. <laughs> as I could have enjoyed it, um, but still, uh, though I guess it was an effort at, at uh, taking out. I had done a lot of the songs, the same songs I did with, with uh, uh, on my first record, the uh, Imperial album, uh, Progressive Blues Experiment. I did several songs that I had done on that record and just kind of rocked them up a little bit. Um, at that period, too, if you, if you remember the late 60s there was such a gigantic blues thing uh, that by 71, 72 nobody wanted to hear anything about blues. I mean in the late 60s everybody had a blues band uh, even, if, even if it really wasn't you know and there was just such a backlash I think from having so much maybe being saturated by blues in the, you know, in the late 60s and, um, the manager I had at that point to uh, couldn't imagine why I wouldn't want to do the music that was making me the most money. And he kept saying, if you want, if you want to have your career uh, keep going now, you just can't keep doing blues during this period here where nobody wants to hear it. And uh, I guess I felt like that, that he might be right. And uh, I really kept kept doing that, the more the more rock and roll stuff until until I uh, worked with Muddy Waters and that convinced there was an audience out there that, that it might not be as big an audience but that I could make a living uh, making straight blues records and, and play more blues and um, that was what I, I really wanted to be to do more blues than I was than I was doing at that point uh, so it was always a desire huh? it really was a desire and working after working with money it, it convinced me that it was it was a definite possibility well tell me about working with money uh, uh, what kind of a guy was he and and what did he teach you uh, he was a real sweetheart. I, I had learned 
a whole lot just listening to his to his records over the years. But it was a, a uh, hard to put it in the right in the right words. It was a big a big influence on, on all of me. Uh, just knowing him as, as as a man, he was he was nice to everybody, but he knew what he wanted and knew what uh, he knew what, what was going on in his life. He, he really he didn't let anybody push him around at all. He did what he was good at and what he loved to do, and he didn't mind getting some help, but he wouldn't do anything that uh, he felt was wrong. He was he was uh, a real pleasure to know and, and to work with, uh, and I, I had learned most of his music, uh, you know, before I ever met him on on records. But sure. That, that was it was great to to be able to play with him and, and see him do those live shows. Uh, it was really one of the greatest influences in my life. Was, working with Buddy would take anything for that experience and how long were you with him? Uh, we did four records together uh, I guess it was four, about four or five years that, uh-huh. uh, before he he died uh, we started working together I think 70 76 or 77 and uh, I think he died in 82 I believe 81 or 82 so who else would be a, a like a mentor for you uh, like a guitar player or Man, really, I bought every every blues record that I could find. I didn't just pick one guy and say this this is what I want to sound like. I just loved blues in general, and uh, I bought literally every every blues record that I could that I could find. Uh, and there were so many people, man, that, that were uh, I learned something from from everybody. You know, people would used to uh, laugh at me, the friends I had that didn't like blues, and they'd say, "Why?" What do you care about people like John Lee Hooker and, and Lightning Hopkins that, that changed on the wrong chord? And, uh, you know, a lot of people thought that wasn't very good music. Uh, uh-huh. But man, some of those guys that, that weren't weren't great musicians, they just had so much feeling. They might not have some of them, some of them weren't good technically, but but just had so much emotion in the playing that you could. Uh, you couldn't learn that, uh-huh. <laughs> you know. You just couldn't learn the, the emotion. But uh, a lot of the players were great musicians, but they, that wasn't what the prerequisite. You didn't to be a, a great blues man. You didn't have to be a great musician. I didn't think it at all. Still, don't think that. Uh, I literally learned something from from everybody though that I that I heard. And I, I I just loved the music and I still do. I uh, you know I can't can't see a blues record that I don't have in the store and pass it by. So is the emotion then the bottom line for you? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. Do you, do you have any preference over playing live uh, or recording? I enjoy doing both of them because they're, they're totally different. Uh, I guess the, the live thing is, is uh, you can't, you know, that's just probably the thing that means the most to me because I've, I've been doing it all my life and I, I just can't imagine not uh, having an audience out there, um, the records are great. I love being able to, you know, to save the performance and have something later that you can, you know, tell what you did 20 or 30 years ago. And that that's real nice. It gives you a feeling of at least your musical will be there for as long as as long as the world just about, you know, as long as the tapes last. Uh, and that's that's a great feeling. I wouldn't want to have to pick one. I guess if I had to pick one, it'd be live performing, though, because there's, there's nothing that can can match the people enjoying what you do. You, you, you get to see it right then. You know if they're liking it or, or not. You know how to change things around, uh, get more slow stuff or more fast stuff. Or, and and that, that's just something that, that I would really miss, not having a live audience. But, but both of them are nice. Uh, so, obviously, you still get something out of playing music and touring and that kind of thing. I think I enjoy the music part of it probably more now than I ever had. Uh, the other the, the frenzy of, of the uh, making it in the rock and roll world, uh, you know, that was a, a gas for a year or so, and then it started being uh, not so much fun. I feel a lot more comfortable right now the place that I'm at. And just the music part of it, uh, I think, is probably more means more to me right now than than it ever has. It seems like it's just uh, I just can't wait to get back out there and get on the road and you know, do some more shows. 
but we don't do it too long. We, uh, we're on the road for a month, and then we take a couple of weeks off. So it's, we're never out there so long that you, you know, really start taking it and missing home a lot. You know. To me, it's the first way of doing it. Uh, Mr. Winter, where are you calling from? New York. Yeah, lived here since, since 68. And one last uh, personal question, and that is, uh, first of all, I got hair going down my back about the same length as yours. How come you keep your hair long? You know, I don't. I always, uh, I, I cut it off uh, from time to time. I get tired of it being that long. And, uh, I, I do get tired of it. Uh, just keep the knots out of it. My hair is real thin, and I, and I wash it. And it takes a big tangler and, and half an hour to get all the uh, uh -huh. out of it, and that's the, that's the problem, but uh, I like having it long, and uh, <laughs> every time I threaten to cut it, so, so many people tell me, oh man, don't do that, don't cut your hair, but <laughs> it seems like every five or six years, though, I'll, I'll get tired and cut it off around my around my shoulders, and then I'll let it, my hair grows real quick, uh, and it seems like oh, it hasn't been but two or three years that I, I cut it, um, oh, about, it was about half halfway down my back. I cut a good six inches off of it and just let it grow back and now I'm just getting, just getting to the length where I'm